Everybody, I'm Dana Lombardi, as you know, with the World War I Historical Association, and this is our chapter meeting for the month of August. The reason you're here is because I'm involved in a project with the Performing Arts Foundation and the American Legion to memorialize and commemorate the end of World War I. They're calling it the Armistice Commemoration Committee, and I was asked to be on this back in February. What you're seeing up here on the walls are the banners that are expressing the story about how America viewed World War I and how we got involved in it and why it's so important. I'm going to be doing a talk later upstairs to explain more of that, a PowerPoint presentation, but we're down here because I wanted you to see what it was that we came up with in order to explain to people, most of whom have no idea about World War I, what were the issues, what happened, and so forth. So, when we got started in this in February, we rushed to try and put together the story. We didn't know how much space we would have. And the Performing Arts Foundation runs the building. It's a complex of actually two buildings, both of which are called the War Memorial Veterans Building. That's why they wanted to commemorate this, is because it was dedicated to and built for the veterans from World War I. Okay? Now, it's obviously been used and has continued to be used by World War II veterans, Korean War veterans, Vietnam War veterans, and so forth, and it will always be a building for them. And the headquarters for a specific post of the American Legion is right here in this building. And at the end of the room here, at the end of the lobby, is what used to be called the Trophy Room. It is now called the Veterans Gallery. There is an actual World War I cannon in there, and we're building a lot of exhibits that will also commemorate World War I. And that will be up by November when we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the armistice that ended World War I. In the meantime, what we had was an issue about how do we explain World War I when all we have is a limited amount of space? What are going to be the topics, the subjects, and so forth? And they brought me on the committee to work with the people who create the banners. They thought that would be a really good way to get people's attention. It is, but I only have eight of these to explain World War I and explain the building, okay? The eighth one, the eighth banner, explains how the building was built, why it was built, and so forth. And that's what they wanted to do, is commemorate so people understood that here we are, right across the street from the uh, City Hall of San Francisco, that they've got this incredible facility that was dedicated to the veterans. The Herbs Theater is right over here. And next door is the Opera House and the San Francisco Ballet. It also used to have the San Francisco Symphony, but that has been moved to a newer building across the street. Both of these buildings say on the outside, War Memorial Veterans Building, and that was because of World War I, which was called initially the Great War. And it wasn't even called World War I, of course, until there was a World War II, which followed 23 years later. What you can do both now and, be, and after we're done talking upstairs, is you can go and look at each of the banners and you can see that we were really trying to emphasize as much of the imagery of the time so people understood what it looked like to people then. What did the people look like? There were a lot of issues that happened. I'm gonna go through those carefully upstairs in my PowerPoint presentation. But a couple of the big issues were women did not have the vote. They, they lobbied for 70 years. 70 years to try and get the vote. World War I gave them the opportunity of earning the vote because of their participation in World War I. This is a huge, huge development socially and culturally. Number two, at the end of World War I, there was the influenza pandemic. We always hear today about a new strain of, it, of flu that hits people and gets sick. Back then, it killed about 20% of the world's population. That many people died, including my grandfather on my father's side, leaving the family with just uh, the mom, the ray, with everybody. This was, this was so broad spread across the nation and across the world that it devastated people. It felt and the influenza killed more people than World War I did. And a lot of people don't realize that. So those two things were huge, and we knew that we had to talk about that so that people understood what people had to deal with back then, because they had no idea. They didn't have the technology, they didn't have the advanced medicine, and so that was two of the things. The other thing, of course, is World War I, why was it such a big deal? 
Well, during the American Civil War, you might have a battlefield with a couple hundred thousand men. That's a huge battle, okay? In World War I, you have battles with millions of men, millions on both sides, and they would lose almost a million in casualties, killed, wounded, and missing. And that was just one battle. And this happened over and over and over. It was on a level that was unprecedented. People didn't even understand what to do. It was over their heads. Technology was beyond their capability. War was beyond their capability. Disease was beyond their capability. And they had to deal with all of this in a four-year period. The United States got involved primarily because Germany did unrestricted submarine warfare, meaning that they would just sink any ship that they encountered because they believed that it would end up going to Britain or France and helping their enemies. So they would just sink those ships without warning, and this is what finally drove the United States into declaring war against Germany and into the war on the side of Britain and France. There were other allies, of course, and there were other nations involved. Russia not only got defeated by Germany, but they signed a treaty which led to a civil war of the Bolsheviks, the people we know as the communists, took over Russia and we had a Cold War as a result for 40 some years after World War II that we were opposed to communist Russia. So that was one of the legacies, and there were many legacies like that that we went through because of World War I. And in fact, the reason it's so important is not only because of the changes I mentioned, all the people of course are dead now from that era. So the other thing that happened was we had World War II as a direct result of World War I. We had the Cold War as a direct result of World War I. And we still have World War I. Why? Why do we still suffer from World War I? ISIS, Al-Qaeda, all of that came as a result of the way that World War I ended. That's very important. It was the worst possible way to end a war. It's the punishment on Germany and then carving up the Middle East, the end of the Ottoman Empire, which was, we know as Turkey. All those little nations were popping up around the Middle East because France and Britain decided to divide that up as the spoils of victory. And they put people together who had no ethnic or religious connections other than the fact they were technically all Muslim, but there were many sects and there were also many groups within those groups uh, that ended up being not happy to be together in an arbitrary country that was usually run by some dictator or some king that was set up by the British or the French. We're still dealing with that. We're still dealing with World War I today, which is why it's so important to look at this, because if there's any one perfect example of what not to do, it's how to end a war was World War I. Thank you very much, and here's what I would like to do. You can look through these, they're very quick to look at. We'll then go upstairs to room 221 where I'll have coffee and biscotti and I'll give a presentation, a little bit more detail of what we're doing. But if you get a chance, walk to the end of the hall there, just look in that room. It's mostly empty for the can, except for the cannon, which is a French 75. That's what America used during the war, one of the cannon. And we can then go on upstairs. So go ahead and look at the posters, the banners, and then we'll go upstairs. Yes, absolutely. Can you go up there now? What? We can go there, right? If you want to come up, we'll, we'll go there right now. Yes.
But most people didn't understand that, and so I made a presentation, very brief, and you'll see it's not very long, to the trustees. And so my first statement to them is, who cares? Who cares? Really? Everyone's dead. I mean, the technology has certainly gone well past whatever was in World War I. Our military doesn't use anything like that. We've got satellites, we've got drones. They never had that stuff. You know, women have the vote, so that's all done. It's like, why do we talk about that stuff? It's like ancient history. Might as well be the Middle Ages, right? I mentioned why that was important, and I will go over that with everyone. Yes, I do. Okay. It's still relevant, relevant because it led to World War II, as we know. That's why it's World War I. It also allowed the Bolsheviks, the communists, to seize control of Russia directly as a result of World War I. And we had a war from 1945 to 1991. Fortunately, not a hot war, which meant armies marching around and bombs dropping. It was a cold war, okay? We had proxies fighting. We had Israel fighting against the Arabs and so forth. And then Britain and France, this is the worst part, I mentioned this downstairs, Britain and France carved up the Ottoman Empire, which we know is Turkey, and they more, made all these little countries out of it, and then just drew lines around, just drew lines there. This is a country, here's Iraq, here's Lebanon, here's Syria, okay? Didn't, it obviously did not work well, okay? That's why it's important, and we still have to deal with that terrorism today. So just give you, I, gave, I mentioned a civil war battle. In uh, 150 years ago, Gettysburg, which is probably the most famous civil war battle, was over three days, big battle. It had a three mile front, 176 soldiers, both sides. 51,000 of them became casualties. And they fired 50,000 artillery shells and 7,000 of those casualties were dead. That's the Battle of Gettysburg, one of the biggest battles of the American Civil War. That was the standard for what warfare was like. The Somme, very famous battle the British were involved in in 1916. This is one, one battle in World War I. It, was, it lasted 141 days. There was a battle that were done that lasted almost an entire year, fighting every day, killing every day. It had a 20 mile front at the Somme, Three million at least, that's just what it started with on both sides. More guys were thrown into it over time. One million casualties, many of those they never found. Most of them they never found in some cases because entire units would disappear. They'd just be blown apart or buried in the mud and the dirt. 1.7 million rounds of artillery shells were fired. That's just the British. And that was only the first day of 141 days. 1.7 million rounds. Not only is that terrible destruction, but think about what that costs. What is the cost of doing that? This one battle cost millions and millions of dollars over 141 days. That's the equivalent of a billion dollars just thrown away in explosives and men. 19,000 dead, dead in the British Army alone, first day, first day, okay? The scale is off the map. There's, there's almost no comparison. I'm showing it here so you understand that people were in shock. The generals had no idea how to deal with this. <laughs> it was beyond their, their ability to reason. They hadn't even learned things like that in their, in their war colleges. It's or in their 11 o'clock. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Janice, to the front. <laughs> it chimes on the hour. World War I disrupted everything. This is a nod to Silicon Valley, okay? Anne thinks that the guys in Silicon Valley are pretentious, you know, a bunch of little geeks who think they're important, but the bottom line is they do have one thing right, using the word disrupt, okay? Because if you say, well, it changed everything, that really doesn't say it, okay? The bottom line is that I can change my clothes. I can change my mind about what I want for lunch. World War I didn't just change everything. It disrupted everything, politically and, and every other level. Warfare, obviously, was disrupted. 
politics was disrupted, technology was disrupted, economies were disrupted, and social institutions, which I mentioned the women getting the vote, huge change in societies, huge. In warfare, it was a stalemate. There was so much lethal, violent weaponry used that you couldn't stand up like you did back in the Civil War and battles before this. You had to hide. You had to go underground. You had to go into trenches. And barbed wire was used just to people make them stop, make them channeled into areas where were killing zones. It became what was called no man's land. And the reason it was called no man's land is because if you stood up, you're going to be killed. Just that simple. And still they had, they kept doing this and trying it for battle after battle after battle. As a result of the generals not being able to figure out how to get around this terrible destruction, there was a loss of the faith in leadership. The lions, the men who were doing the actual fighting, were led by donkeys. That was not my expression, that's what they came up with. The guys who were fighting it finally just got fed up with their officers. The, the French army mutinied, refusing to fight anymore except to defend France. And then the nice thing that happened for us is we all were Americans. Up to this point, we had huge influx of immigrants. We had them from Southern, we had them Irish, we had the Southern Europeans coming in, we had people from all over the world. We used Indian code talkers, meaning American Indians, not Indian Indians, but American Indians. They were code talkers, and the reason we had that is because they could literally talk in Cherokee or, or Chickasaw or whatever their language was, and the Germans couldn't figure out what they were saying. So they were able to talk between American units using code talkers, which we did again in World War II. Thousands of immigrants. In fact, some of them couldn't even speak English. So we had that issue that we had to deal with. And African American, the Harlem Hellfighters, became famous, but they weren't allowed to fight in the American Army. President Woodrow Wilson and the Democrats did not want to integrate the Army, and they did not want to have African Americans in the government. And so as a result, they were only allowed to do rear area uh, work, except that they wanted to fight, and the French needed soldiers, and so Pershing was able to convince Rodolf, um, Wilson to let the African Americans fight with the French. And then, because of discrimination, racism and discrimination, they had to deal with that. Okay, politics, what changed there? Well, propaganda and sustaining the war, this is a huge thing because one of the things you may notice on all those banners downstairs are all the posters. That was the first time that that many banners were, uh, posters were created, some of them by very famous artists at the time who donated their work to the government as their way of contributing to the war effort. And they were colored, they're beautiful, and they have very powerful messages about why we're fighting and why we have to support the war effort. Keeping up the morale on the home front was used all over the place. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing these posters. Remember, there's no social media 100 years ago, okay? There's no talky movies, there's silent movies. And they did use them to also spread the word and try and convince people. But most people got their information at church, they got it from speeches being given in, in City Hall and other locations. They got it reading newspapers, okay? But these posters became a visual uh, piece of information that they were able to get from their government and from institutions like the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, etc. Okay, there was a committee of public information which is basically handling all propaganda for the United States. This is all from our perspective, by the way. This is what we're looking at, what had happened to America. And the Sedition Act that was promoted by Wilson and passed by Congress basically made it illegal for you to say anything bad. You could not protest the war because it was seen as helping our enemies. You would be arrested. There were papers that were shut down. There were people that were imprisoned during the war for voicing anti-war sentiments. Okay, and then as probably you've heard this expression, the first casualty of war is truth. And that's what a lot of people then learn from the war is that 
you know, people who sincerely didn't want to be involved in the war, that were pacifists, or thought the war was wrong, even if they weren't pacifists, were being shut down and shut up. We also had submarines in the blockade. Now, the fact is, all warfare has hurt civilians. In the Middle Ages, when a siege happened, the people who lived in that town or that castle, if they weren't soldiers, they also suffered. Okay? During the Thirty Years' War through Germany, civilians were slaughtered, okay? especially if they were a different religious group than the group that just came in with the soldiers. Okay? So this is not new. What was new is that they had the Hague Convention, they had the Geneva Convention of trying to limit the amount of damage being done to the civilian population and people who were non-combatants. It was only so there were rules about how to treat soldiers who were captured and how to treat civilians. Well, a lot of that just went out the door because German submarines and the British blockade were intentionally designed to kill people. Everybody, children, women, civilians, didn't matter, old people. They were trying to force the government of Germany, or in this case England, if the submarines were being used, by starving their people. It's just that simple. They wanted to have people starving so that it would force their governments to surrender or at least negotiate. And then one of the things that happened, the Armenian Holocaust. Turkey was really upset about the fact that Russia was overrunning its western region, and that's where a lot of the Armenians were located, and the Armenians were Christian in a Muslim country, and were, some of them were absolutely helping the Russians who were Christian, Orthodox, against the Turks. And they just couldn't afford to let these people running around behind their lines. And so they just literally drove them out of their villages and they didn't have camps. No, they didn't have to set up death camps. They just simply drove people out of their villages, out into the desert without water or food, and they all died. Millions, millions. This Holocaust is the first one that was recorded. America recorded this, tried to do something about it. A lot of Armenians left Turkey left the Ottoman Empire and came to the United States, which is why we have the Kardashians, okay? So, <laughs> <laughs> not the best way to get people. <laughs> 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 but you can see that, you know, this is, this is a big deal, and it shows you, you know, some people came to this country not because they wanted to, but because they had to, all right? This is the kind of stuff that was going on, and it predates the Holocaust and World War II, the Shoah, that affected primarily the Jews. Technology. Well, submarines were, were not totally new, but they were now able to manufacture enough submarines and, that could function and be lethal enough to affect warfare. So it was a brand new weapon that way. Aeroplanes. The White Brothers obviously had invented the flying, flying machine, but now we had thousands and thousands of airplanes on both sides trying to affect the battles. Okay? They were used for reconnaissance, they were used for bombing, and of course they fought each other. The Red Baron, okay? They were trying to dominate the air. So now you had warfare in three dimensions. Four if you want to count under the water, okay? And then tanks were invented specifically to try and break that stalemate. I told you about no man's land, so they could cross the battlefield in these armored uh, carriers. And then radios. Radios were now being used for the first time on a massive scale so they could try and talk to each other and coordinate. But these are all new technologies and they're just figuring out how to use them. Old weapons were then modernized. For example, trenches. There had always been trenches, but now they were really developed into systems, complex systems. Uh, barbed wire, I mentioned, they had that for many years to, to keep cattle and so forth penned in areas. But these barbed wire, this barbed wire was anti-personnel, big barbs on it, and the Germans de developed what was called steel reinforced barbed wire, which we know as razor wire, okay? So when you look at an area, you know, people don't want to climb. Imagine how they kind of go through that. Well, they couldn't. Machine guns, there have been machine guns before that that have been used in previous wars, but now they had not just a few machine guns, they ended up with hundreds of machine guns. Almost everybody would be able to operate a machine gun. And so the amount of bullets being spewed out across the battlefield was enormous. And then artillery, you saw the one cannon, that's a small artillery piece. That was at the start of the war, small, had a shell about that big. There were guns that would not fit in this room, that would throw a shell 
bigger than a Volkswagen bug. When it hit an area, the concussion alone would kill in almost a, a football field area with one shell. Okay? So it just shows you that the lethality, the increase in the destructiveness of the weapons was huge. And if that wasn't bad enough, let's add poison gas. Okay? We're not only going to kill you with bullets and machine guns, right? And with explosives, we're going to gas you with gas that will fill your lungs with, with uh, liquid and drown you, or mustard gas that will burn your skin off, okay? So now you have everything being thrown at you, and how can you survive? Well, obviously a lot of guys didn't. Even the ones who did survive were called suffering from shell shock, literally shell shock, which we know today as PTSD. It's happened all the way back then. They just didn't know what to call it or how to deal with it. And a lot of those guys back then came home and got hooked on drugs because they were in such pain. Today it's opium. We know that the crisis is opium. And back then it was, um, I believe it was um, morphine. Mm -hmm. Morphine or, or yeah, morphine? morphine was the primary thing that they used, right? So a lot of became morphine addicts. Or they drank. Mm -hmm. Or they drank. That was that was typical. Okay. And medicine, of course, the good news is one thing that happens in warfare is they do everything they can to try and save these guys. So there's no. What's the downside of trying something, right? If the guy's going to die on the table, you might as well try something. So they came up with new techniques and two technology. So shell shock, I mentioned PTSD, plastic surgery, especially facial. If you're down in the trench, how do you get out? So where are you going to get shot or blown up? A lot of guys had less than, and this is amazing, that they would be, they have half of their face torn off by a shell and they still survive. That wouldn't happen in the Middle Ages, didn't happen in other wars, but there were thousands and thousands of men who ended up having prosthetics because they lost limbs and also facial reconstruction, which became a big deal. Today, we think of plastic surgery as body sculpting. We do it to enhance our body. Back then, it was necessary to save people's appearances, the soldiers who had hideous wounds. In fact, the French had so many that they put a bench in parks and cities and towns where they would be, they would be allowed to sit so they wouldn't upset other people who would look at them and just be shocked. It wasn't too nice the way they treated a lot of their soldiers, but we also know that that happens even today. The economies. Well, how do you finance it? I just said, that how much is that expensive just to have that one battle? Billions of dollars, the equivalent to what we would spend a day, like a trillion dollars, which is thrown away on killing each other, on destroying each other. Well, you have to pay for that somehow. So, we not only, our government, I'm going to talk about America, not only do we want you to risk your life, okay, either because you volunteer or I draft you into the military, but I want you to pay for it, okay? You're not only going to be the one I throw away in battle, I want you to pay for it. And how you do that is you get a, a loan, one of the liberty bonds, that you pay money for, and the treasury issues to you, and after the war, in so many years, it matures, and you'll make a profit. So billions of dollars are raised through just average purchases, including the soldiers who would put a certain percentage of their money, their, their pay, for these bonds. And that's how the government would finance it. So merchants of debt, the guys who made the weapons, who made the bombs, who made the poison gas, they made a lot of money. 21,000 Americans, this is just America, 21,000 Americans became millionaires or billionaires billionaires a hundred years ago. That's like somebody becoming a trillionaire today. It's just, this is, it's, it's like wealth, just insane. It didn't come, become millionaires or billionaires or trillionaires like over 10 years, 20 years. It was like in a couple of years, bam, I just make all these weapons, I make all these ships, whatever it is that we need, and I am going to be filthy rich, beyond comprehension rich. 
Have you ever heard the expression Daddy Warbucks? <laughs> that was <laughs> little orphan Annie's step our, our foster father, right? Mm -hmm. Daddy Warbucks. How did he make his money? Right? He made his money because he was a merchant of death and made his money during World War I and became a billionaire. So he could afford to give little orphan Annie all the wonderful things in the world. Okay? So one of the things that was really important is Britain doubled down during the war, and the only way they could do that is by financing France, Russia, Italy, all the other allies who were poor couldn't afford to spend all this money, so they did. And what that meant was who was providing them with all the stuff they were buying? USA, USA. We made lots of that stuff from not only England, but all the allies. And that meant we made the money. And so the world's financial center during the war switched from London to New York. And we became the center of the financial world has not changed since. Total war. This is where women got to put, there's an expression when you go into business, so you have to have skin in the game, okay? You have to have something that you're risking, whether it's financial, whatever it is. And for 70 years, women did not get the vote. They asked for it. They said they deserved it. The men said, not happening. You know, why? What's the motivation? Who cares, right? You can't make us if you would. Women got involved in the war, and I'll show you in a separate set of slides, just how much women were in that war, especially American women. That led directly, because women didn't just have skin in the game, they had blood in the game. Women were killed, gassed, died of disease, wounded, and had everything bad happen to them, not on the same scale, obviously, but men saw this. They saw this. They were over there with these women and went back, and women said, no, no, it's not happening anymore. We're not giving up all of our rights to vote and hold office and everything else. We are going to have change because it's war, and we serve. That is a huge change. Women went into the farms, the factories, and took over a lot of male jobs because in America alone we had 2 million males volunteer for the military and 2.4 million were drafted. Okay, this is all in a certain age group. So more than 4 million men were taken out of these jobs. Well, somebody has to do those jobs and keep the factories running and the farms running and women did that. The U.S. Navy was the first branch of service that recruited women specifically. They were, they were called Yo Man, with an F behind it for female, but the press, of course, immediately called them Yo Manettes, okay? There's also the Women's Land Army, that's the women who worked on the farms. They were nurses, which is a traditional role for women, ambulance drivers. One of the reasons for that is because not everyone had a car, not everyone could drive a car in the early 1900s. Usually you had, to be, you had to be wealthy to be able to do that or your job would require. Who was able to drive cars? Women of the upper class in America. They were able to drive and so therefore they became ambulance drivers, which means they also were in danger of getting killed, which happened. We also had the Salvation Army, which has been around for a long time. Women who went over there, set up camps, set up uh, canteens, which is basically a place for the gentlemen to go, the soldiers to go, where no alcohol was served, okay? And the women would make donuts. That's why they're called the donut girls. I'll show you that in the next PowerPoint. Communications behind the lines in France was critical, and so a lot of the women, they're called hello girls because they were the ones who basically ran all the communications behind the lines through the, uh, the telephones, okay? And what else could young women who were educated do? What was the other language they were taught back then? French. So therefore, the women acted as translators for all of our soldiers, our officers, when dealing with the French, who were our allies. Yes? So there weren't any women in the American Field Service? American Field Service, the ambulance drivers. Okay. Yes. And then, of course, during the war in 1915, the um, Pan American Exhibition happened here because the Panama Canal was open and that allowed us, California specifically, to send troops 
more quickly instead of across country by train, they could go through the Panama Canal and reach Europe. Do you have a question? That was faster than taking it. Yes, absolutely. Social institutions, okay, well I mentioned that there were not everybody was happy with war. They weren't happy with the war in Europe. And so pacifism started even before we got involved. Henry Ford basically bankrolled a, uh, a ship that went over to Europe trying to make the Europeans stop fighting. Didn't work, but he, he tried to finance anti-war thought and sentiment in Europe. Uh, there were anti-war demonstrations here, but not after the Sedition Act happened, okay? And Hoover Hoover, a lot of people don't like him anymore because he blamed for the Great Depression, but he was a major humanitarian, and he tried to, uh, he was the head of the American Relief Administration that sent food and Red Cross supplies to everybody, not just one side. We were trying, as America, to not get involved and to try and help stop the war. Women's suffrage, I told you about that, and there was a huge debate among women about, well, you know, do we, do we just put our demands for suffrage aside temporarily and be patriotic and support this war, or do we continue to basically hammer the president and say, hey, don't forget us. You'll see that there's a picture in one of those banners downstairs, okay? And then the arts, poetry, and literature. Poetry was a big deal back then. It was a major form of literature that almost everybody did. Just to give you an example, on the first month of the war in August of 1914, 50,000 German poems appeared in German newspapers, okay? Poetry was a big deal. It was highly respected. Britain and France, of course, obviously as well. And we know the ones from Britain because it's in English and we can read those. We can still read them today. Well, it's the poppy. So, okay. Pardon? Yeah, fields. Poppy. The symbolism is the poppy. Yes, that's right. Yeah, field. That's right. Anyway, so Picasso, who was a big name artist at the time, an abstract artist and the new modern way of doing art, and he came, he didn't come up with dazzle camouflage, but he came up with a cubist style of camouflage, and another artist came up with dazzle, which is where you paint a ship with really bright colors and stripes and things on it, it looks amazing. And the reason for that is when the U-boats are looking through their periscope, the captain has to estimate the speed of the vessel so he can fire the torpedo to hit it. That broke up the silhouette of the ship and disguised its, its um, speed because he has two, here it looks a stereoscopic, and he's trying to line them up and it's harder to do that because the ship has these bright stripes and weird colors and everything on them. Um, I told you about the posters serving propaganda and bond drives, and then there was a movie, All Quiet on the Western Front, which came out many years later, and it was really controversial. Why? Because it told the story from a German soldier's viewpoint. These were the enemy, these were the bad guys, right? And again, that, that there's a huge pacifist movement after the war because it was so horrible and so awful. People didn't see the Germans as evil. They saw them as victims, just like everybody else. And then, of course, there was a lot of disillusion, and disillusion with their government. Their government not only lied to them, not only, this is everybody, British government, American government, that's why we didn't want to get into World War II initially. It's like, we don't want to be involved in this stuff anymore. We were lied the first time. We're not going to get, we're not going to be conned into another war. Anyway, here's, here's my summary, which is the good, the bad, and the ugly for all those that know Sergio Leone, you know, and the uh, spaghetti westerns. The good is America became a major world power. We were not a major world power. We had a couple hundred thousand people in our military, and we had a navy that was okay, but we really say, no, no, America just wants to do business. We're not interested in Europe. We're not, that changed. That all changed. We had no choice after World War I. Jazz was introduced in 1915. Jazz as we know it started in 1915, and women got the vote. The, the uh, Senate had been the one that was stymied the whole thing after, and, um, in Congress. In 1919, it was passed, but it still had to be uh, ratified by the states. That final ratification came in 1920, and Ameri uh, women in America got the vote. 
popular culture. We have this building, the War Memorial Veterans Building, and the Performing Arts Center. And so Howard Hughes did a famous movie called Hell's Angels with a lot of airplanes. It was a spectacular, it was a huge movie on a scale that was unprecedented. And then you had Daddy Warbucks and Orphan Annie, which I mentioned to you, very popular comic strip series. And we have Snoopy and the Red Baron. Yay, Snoopy. So we still have a connection to World War I. People know that. And in fact, if you tell anybody about that or ask them about Snoopy and the Red Baron, they'll, te they'll tell you what it's all about. Snoopy flying his Sopwith camel, which is his doghouse, right? Oh, uh-oh. Uh-oh. No, don't do this. Try <laughs> again. They then made it a pretend French word, Mosier, 
M-O-S-I-E-R, the lake with the French because they didn't want to have their house burned. So there are a lot of people angry with the Germans because they promoted hatred of Germany in order to get people excited about going into the war. Um, and of course, there was racism towards African Americans, against Chinese, about all kinds of people, even though they were serving America. And the world, unfortunately, was not made safe for democracy, which is what Woodrow Wilson was hoping for. Um, and then the new, ideal, uh, new ideologies led to oppressive regimes. We know about the Bolsheviks, we know about strongmen all over, the, all over the planet, and all the other things that we have to deal with. So, I got rid of monarchy. Well, it got rid of five empires, okay? It got rid of the Russian Empire, and the Tsar and his family were murdered by the Tsar. It got rid of the Ottoman Empire, and it got rid of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it got rid of the German. It got rid of the German Empire because the Kaiser was basically thrown out. It wasn't murdered, but there were a lot of people that wanted to hang. But ultimately, Britain, I think you might want to say something about armistice versus surrender. Why well, they did it to the Americans as opposed to, you know, the French or the So, a couple things. When America got involved, we were not direct allies. The allies, the original Entente, which was the three countries of Russia, Great Britain, and France, they agreed they would not make a separate peace. They would all have to surrender. They all worked together so that they would be a united front against Germany. Okay. That didn't happen because Russia, as I mentioned, made a deal because it was being thrown into civil war. But America, when it came in, was a co-belligerent. It's very important because here's what happened. In 1918, as Germany sees what's happening, America's army is growing. They're going to overwhelm the Germans. They're learning very quickly how to fight, and Germany just cannot oppose that kind of huge increase and win the war. So rather than wait until the Allies have overrun Germany, they say, hey, we accept Wilson's 14 points. Wilson had basically proposed, before we were involved, that there were 14 points that would he would then support negotiating and ending the war. So at the middle of the, almost the edge of starting to win all the rest of the battles that they needed to do to overrun Germany, the German leadership goes, we accept 14 points. And Wilson goes, okay, war's over. This really was not the thing that Britain and France wanted here, okay? But they also could not continue fighting on their own. So that's why there was not an unconditional surrender. It was never part of the, the conditions that the Allies were fighting and not America's conditions for fighting. That changed in World War II because we totally devastated Germany and change the way that the, nego the negotiations work. Yes? Yeah, what were some of the questions the trustees asked when you were making this presentation? What were some of the questions? They had no questions. They didn't even know about yeah. World War I. They, they didn't even know what the building was they built for. Don't you think that was a very profound thing? They had no questions. Well, there's a problem. Pardon? Problem that they would have so minimal so you would be important. They had no background on it at all. I mean, they, you have to know something about it or at least have questions about it. But they wanted a 15-minute presentation. I did one much longer here because we have a, a group that doesn't have to rush through it. But I was one item on their agenda that day, okay? Mm -hmm. so, Are you embarrassed by that? No. How do you build it again? It's just like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Okay. Yes? I'm a little disappointed you didn't mention the 100,000 in the guy. 40,000 are still buried. Yes. I have 15 minutes to give this, and I have changed. I gave 30 minutes. Well, I, I don't think most people realize how many people died. How We're, many Americans so And died. that will be one of the displays, in fact, here, is how many Americans died, as well as mentioning, in fact, I think one of the banners mentions how many people died. One of the things I'd like to share, because it, so, it was so moving for me, we have a very small American cemetery in Belgium. The Belgians have all adopted a grave yet. And there's even a wait, waiting list to adopt a grave. And they go over, they go and they put flowers on it and clean it and keep it up and it's so beautiful and they try, and many of them have contacted survivors, you know, relatives of the folks in the graves. Yep. That was very moving. And on Memorial Day, I think it is at Bella Wood, where there was that's where the Marines sort of that's one of the 
a significant part of their legacy. 5,000 friends show up every year to remember them. So. Okay. Where's, where's the other one? I'm going to give the last one. There are beautiful memorials all over northern France. Okay, there is. You're a new American woman. Okay, here we go. It's not like you just got back from there. Uh, when you well, I got back in here. Oh, no. I should have gone this year. <laughs> but I think I know all the uh, The tour, uh, tour company. Right. Right. I've done many of the battles. Away from tours. the channel and the Swiss board. Okay, so the trustees did do this. I mean, they didn't have a lot of time. They're very busy and they have an agenda. They can only have to do so much time for that day, right? They weren't there to learn about the robot water or ask too many questions, but they said, we like this idea, go for it. But they didn't do this. Then they talked about it and they said, hey, can you come back and do some more of this, okay? We have no idea, but we're now really interested. So I came back and I decided specifically to do it on women because most of the people on the trustees board are women. Okay, so it's like, okay, I already mentioned this several times, you earned the vote. Earned the vote. No one gave it to you, okay? This is very important. So I, I said, here's what happened, okay? Nearly 5 million American men served in the military in World War I, okay? More than 2 million men volunteered for the Army and the Navy. Another 2.8 million were drafted, okay? Not all of them made it overseas, by the way, were in it before they got overseas. All right, thousands of other men had joined the Canadian Army before we got involved because they wanted to fight with, with either the British or, the, or they fought with the French in the Lafayette Escadrille, which are rich guys who could fly airplanes. Okay, and they went over there to prove their manhood and so forth. And uh, some people were unhappy with that. And the Germans said, no, no, no. They're either in the French Army because there is no American Army. So American Army, you basically declare war in Germany. And Wilson said, no, we are not. Declared war in Germany. Okay. So what happened? We don't know how many American women served because there were no records on that. Okay. I mean, they're scattered among a lot of different organizations. The Red Cross, the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association, Salvation Army, and so forth. They, and not all that stuff has been digitized. So no one's really ever gone in there to see how many women have served. Okay. Women also replaced male workers on the farms and the factories. In the government, a lot of them are stenographers, okay, typists and so forth, because again, the men were gone. Up to that point, men served in almost every business role, and women were supposed to stay home and take care of the house, the home life, and the children, all right? And that all changed, because with all those men gone, they needed the women. All right, so best estimate, 40 million American women did something even if it was, even if they worked full time at home, they made victory gardens or liberty gardens where they would raise food to try and not only feed themselves and their families, they sent, America sent food to these countries that were starving. Britain was suffering from the submarine warfare. France was suffering because so many men had been pulled off the farms. They didn't have enough women to do everything. So we sent food, as I told you about Herbert Hoover and the American Relief uh, organization. Okay, so growing food in the victory gardens, uh, adhering to the rationing, you can only have so much sugar, so much flour, and so forth. They even knitted socks for soldiers. Why is that a big deal? It's huge. The army could not supply enough socks. Why is that important? I just told you they've done trenches, right? What, what it collects at the bottom of a trench? <coughs> water. So guys are standing in water for hours and hours, and it's not always nice weather. Sometimes it's cold, it's freezing, and what happens? You get trench foot, which is the same as like gangrene. Soldier is just as much knocked out and wounded by foot, uh, foot trench foot as he would be by a bullet. So sending socks, all these women making socks and sending them overseas was a huge deal. And then of course the women also bought liberty bonds or stamps. They would show kids buying them. You'll see that on the banners downstairs. Okay, so food ration, big deal. Because you limit how much you're taking in, you can send more to the troops overseas and to our allies and their civilians. So, yeah, so they basically had books on this, they had recipes where you could use substitute materials to uh, use in place of things that were now under rationing. 
knitting socks. I told you about this. This is a big deal. This is a really big deal. There are a lot of men who did not lose their feet because women sent socks. And there she is, everyone's mom, okay? And you could buy these bonds, you could buy this, you know, please give us the money so I can get my son back or my yeah, but the socks get wet too, though. That's why you have to have many socks. You just keep changing it. You have to keep, you have changing, you have to keep changing your socks. But your, the boots are still wet. Right? Tough. As long as you keep changing your socks, that's what it's in the Yes. Yes. Put up and that's that's the 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 There's no perfect solution, but by changing it into dry socks, okay, you don't end up with your feet wet 24-7. Yeah. And especially wool, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Anyway, so women also wore a lot of uniforms, okay? Even though they weren't in the military, a lot of these organizations and groups had women wearing uniforms, so they took advantage of the opportunity. Here's the National League for Women's Service, okay? The women, the woman army, okay? So the women were involved, and they were visible everywhere, in uniform, helping the cause. The most famous and the one that we know way back when that started with the Nightingale was the Red Cross, and it's traditional for women to be nurses, but this is on a scale, again, huge, compared to anything that went before it. Millions of men were in the service, millions of women ended up serving in the Red Cross. The YWCA, the Young Women's Christian, Young Women's Christian Association, said for every hire a woman worker, so for every guy who went over, it was the intention, women got behind this big time, even though there was a big debate among the suffrage movement, you know, do we support the war? Or do we say, no, no, we're not going to do this, we're just going to continue working for women's suffrage. And the majority of women said, no, I want my son, my husband, my brother, I want them back. I want them back. And the only way it's going to happen is we win the war and we have to support this. Here's another shot. Again, notice the uniforms. They're all wearing uniforms. Okay. One of the thousand YMC, there's a young men's Christian association, and they served in that as well. So women were everywhere. Here's a woman worker, factory worker. So even the outfits they wore into the factory, they would wear a style of uniform. Okay? So there they are making airplanes and ships. Okay? Which, by the way, um, there were women, there were accidents, so women could get killed and poisoned by the stuff they were working with in the factories. And of course, the ones I talked about, the Hello Girls, there she is, and the switchboard, keeping contact between the different units behind the lines, but behind the lines is relative. Planes can fly over the lines. These cannon fired so far behind the lines that the women were in danger from that, from gas, from explosions, from bombs, and the fact is there were sometimes breakthroughs and the, and the women could be killed or wounded from that as well. Here's the Women's Land Army. In this country, the women would go out and take the place of the men who are now overseas fighting, and so they would serve on the farms. They drive the tractors, they collect the, the food, etc., etc., and many of them did incredibly well when given the opportunity to just simply run the businesses. And then the Salvation Army, I talked about the Donut Girls. This was a big deal. When you don't have enough to eat, men hardly had enough just to keep them sustained. They got the lion's share of the food, but that wasn't usually enough. <coughs> These guys weren't producing anything other than casualties. So, you know, that's huge. These women were being killed, were being blown up, gassed, and they still sat out there and did donuts and baby the guys. Remember, these guys are now going to come home. They're going to look at the guys who are running the politics, and they're going to say, "We're not going to give these women the right to vote." Say, no, that's that's not happening. There is a yeoman. This is what they're out there. The first branch of the American served in the military to recruit women was the Navy, which is why our people uh, are very friendly to the Navy. The Marines were the next one, of course, because the Marines were part of the Navy. So in service in World War I, American women were <coughs> voted, and after the war, President Richard Wilson spoke to Congress in favor of passing the 19th Amendment. That's what he said. We have made partners of the women in this war. Shall we admit them only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil 
and not to a partnership of privilege and right. And the coercion. And that's, that is exactly what happened. And that was my second. Yes? Just out of curiosity, so when did the English women get the right? A year later. 15 minutes. Anne, and another one of our members, Julie Velasquez, went there. Anne was wearing a white WCA uniform from the period, and Julie was wearing a cross uniform, and they did a first-person impression and explained what they did during the war. Okay? And so the women who were the trustees, remember they were running theatrical and you know, performing arts. And so they really appreciated this, and we did a little bit of a um, um, dog and pony show with, with the kind of thing that people enjoy. Anyway, those are the two presentations that I made to the trustees, and that's what we're working on. And we're going to continue to add more displays and more exhibits, and that's going to happen all the way through the summer. You can come back and see these things. It's absolutely free. The gallery is free. Coming into the, the lobby here and looking at it, there will be maybe a couple of additional cases that will be put into the lobby. We're going to talk about propaganda and other things, uh, but the exhibits and the gallery will be up, and I will let everyone know when this is available so you can come back and view it. Um, I have a question. The UCF Library has been, uh, there's a, Exhibit there of uh, people from UCSF. Yes. The Olympic Club, I believe the Olympic Club had a lot of uh, Olympic men that served over there. Our presentation was online. No. Oh, oh well, well, we have the, the images of those banners are online, and there will be, like, this, this is being recorded. Right? Your images? Yes. I'm going to be giving it to the gentleman who is recording this. Okay, that'll be online, probably YouTube. But we'll let everyone know when that happens. And we're also going to have a speaker series, okay? So we're going to have this lady scheduled who is going to talk about World War I and California. So there'll be specific things about that. Okay. And when, when was this displayed uh, 